the uses of the model we've generally been talking about have been more oriented towards planning and design kind of considerations. But there's a huge area in which modeling can be useful in, in terms of operations. There's just a whole area. I mean, if you're going to build a model, let's use it. You know, don't just say, oh, I built this model. I'm only going to use it for this one purpose. I mean, models can be used all over the water utility. So let's talk about the operations side of things now. I suppose if I asked anybody if you guys were in operations, probably no one, if we were alive, you know, no one would raise their hand if they're an operator, but they really should have your operators in the class with you to show them all the things they can do in terms of operations. So if you want to yell down the hall to some, you know, system operators, say, come on in here and watch this, you know, feel free to do that, or you can share your screen with them somehow. It's really, there's a lot of uh, valuable usage of modeling in operations. So the, the basic tool of the operator in terms of hydraulics in the control room operator is integrating it with the SCADA system. And SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. I hope you already knew that, but just in case you didn't. Uh, and it's the, the process of getting data, in this case from some Venturi meters, uh, taking that data, which is usually some type of analog differential pressure, and converting it into a digital signal at the RTU, and you send that back to the control room for display. And that's part of what the SCADA system does, but it does a lot more than that, and we gotta take advantage of it. So let's look at hydraulic models versus SCADA systems. It should be versus, but let's just uh, do it for now, put that dividing line between them. On one side, the hydraulic model can solve for things that haven't happened yet. And, or it can, and if you have data at a few points, it can calculate results for places in between known measured points in your system. And it can calculate things that you can't measure, you aren't measuring at the SCADA system. It might be able to calculate hydraulic grade line, which you don't get directly, or velocity, things like that, which you really don't measure directly. The problem with models are it doesn't know what's going on right now in the system. So you can't bring in live boundary conditions or initial conditions for a model run. SCADA system, on the other hand, knows what's going on right now and it knows what went on in the past. So it's got that kind of information. However, it can't be good, very, very good for projecting to the future, extrapolating the, what the trends were into the future, except just through dumb extrapolation, which isn't very good. And it can't fill in between sensors because, you, you know, if you have, you know, 20,000 nodes in your model, you may have 20 monitoring points. But what about the other 19,000 points in your system? Well, it can't fill in except by just guesstimating. So the SCADA system has the strengths and weaknesses. The models have their strengths and weaknesses. So let's let's put them together and marry them together. They comp those technologies complement one another. The SCADA system can provide initial conditions, boundary conditions for the model. It can provide historical patterns that you can use to compare the model to for calibration, as you mentioned a couple of days ago. And the model, of course, can then be used to fill in between the sensors, say what's going on. It can tell you the properties the, the SCADA system isn't measuring. And most importantly, it can project what's going to happen in the future. SCADA systems just can't do that. And this is can be so valuable to the operator. The operators have not taken advantage of this. There are some utilities where the operators are well integrated with the engineers. But in many cases, they're in two different silos. And it's really unfortunate. We need to break down those walls between the, the operators and the, the modeling people. So what is SCADA Connect? Well, it's really a general name for a couple of things. One is it's the, it's the ability to link the water gems with the SCADA system and bring data into the model from the SCADA system, such as initial conditions, for example, initial tank levels, which pumps are running. But also there's a bigger uh, use in terms of what we call SCADA Connect Simulator which is the ability to give the operator a real simple user interface or somebody who isn't a modeling expert, not, you know, not one of you guys that went through the whole class now and are experts nowadays, but somebody who is just, you know, knows the basics of hydraulics can get in there and make a quick model run based on a scenario that you provided for them as a base scenario. So that's a really powerful tool that's available for them. And there's a lot of things you can do with this. On the first area here, the SCADA system can bring in initial conditions, could be used for calibration, developing model demands, but the real good uses are emergency planning. You can use the model for that in operations. Uh, scheduling preventive actions uh, or scheduling flushing is a good thing where you could use your model to help plan your flushing. You take a tank out of service, what's going to happen? Well, you can model that before you take the tank out of the service for painting. You can find out what's going to happen. You can see what's going to happen if you close a valve or change a, a valve spacer. What if you're going to turn the pump on at a different time in the control statement? Well, you can see what's going to happen before you do this and what's going to happen several hours from now if you do this. 
So there's a lot of value in having the model available to support operator decision making. Okay, so let's look at the first in, in use case here. This is where you're going to want to bring SCADA data into the model. Now, we have a number of ways of doing this in water gems. Uh, we have a thing called observed data, where if you're in a graph and you can point to some observed data in a spreadsheet or something, you can bring it in. Time series data, uh, field data is another way you can bring in this data. These are some older technologies we've had in water gems for a while. The big one I want to talk about today is going to be the SCADA Connect element. And those are those little black things here that look like radio signals. How you can actually place a model element that is the SCADA signal. And then when using Darwin Calibrator, there's also ways to import SCADA data there. But I'm going to focus on the SCADA Connect elements. Okay, and SCADA element, therefore, is this nice little modeling element. And it can get data from a couple of sources. One is some type of database file, some type of file. And we'll show you the different formats you could have a file with data. Or it can go directly to the OPC server. For those of you who don't work with SCADA very much, OPC is kind of the language of SCADA systems. Okay, And somewhere in the heart of your SCADA system is a server that is running OPC. And this is the guy that gets the, the signals, the raw signals, in from this field and puts them in some format where they can be stored or displayed on the human machine interface. So that's what the server does. So we could read directly out of that server if you have data in there. Of course, in order to do this, you've got to understand how is the data stored? What's the format? What kind of rows and columns you have and names and units and all? So this is kind of the way data flows. This is kind of just an overview. I think the slides should probably have come earlier. So you have some piece of equipment out there, the pressure gauge, a flow meter, something out there, tank level indicator, and you've got a sensor in there. And that sensor goes to some kind of unit like a RTU, where it does analog to digital conversions and, and stores it in the system and, and it sends that signal back to the main control room where it goes to the uh, OPC server. And generally that is displayed in the HMI. Now HMI stands for human machine interface. It's that stuff that you see on the screen. That is the human machine interface that connects the, the server that has the data with the operator. So the operator sees the data. He sees what the tank level is or what pumps are running, what the flow rate is at this flow meter. That's wonderful. Now you as a modeler want to get at this data. You need this information to test the model, to calibrate it, to know how to start your next model run. So how do you get that data? Well, usually there's some contorted path that you go through to get that data, that traditional way of doing things. You call the operator, say, I need this data. And he says, well, you got to check with my supervisor if I give you this data. And he's talked to the supervisor. And he gets back to you two days later. And he says, OK, operator, give this modeler the data. And you say, OK, great. And they say, Two days later, you go, well, I haven't gotten the data yet. And the guy goes, oh, I've been busy, and I'll get it to you eventually. And then maybe two or three weeks later, you get a file that doesn't have exactly what you asked for initially. And it's, it's kind of a, a tortuous path for, for somebody who's in model who's not tied in directly with the operator to get this kind of data. So this is why I mentioned earlier in the week that you, know, you should be friends with the operators because they can make or break your workflow. You know, you really got to build that personal relationship. But, but wouldn't it be nice if we could automatically bring this data in? So that's what we've worked on. And that's what these data signal elements are. So these are things you plop them down in the model. And they're basically the connection between some model element, whether in this case it's a pipe and it's, a, it's actually a signal. OK, so this is the signal from the pipe. In this case, it's the flow in that pipe. And that's a signal this is. That's what this represents. And this thing then goes out and connects to your SCADA data. So what form is the data? can the data be in? Well, I said there's a number of file formats as well as the, directly into the OPC server. And here's a list of some of those file formats that we support. And we're always adding to this kind of list. So the data, if you ask for data, we probably have it in some form that you can use. But you need to understand what that form is. OK? So, this, uh, these are the two formats that we want to see data in. So one of those formats is for every row in that table you have or every record in your database, you want to have a timestamp, the name of that tag in the SCADA system, what the value is. And then if you have, want, you also have a quality index of whether, you think that, whether the SCADA system thinks that's a good or a bad data point. So that's one of the formats is one value per row. The other format we can accept is multiple values per row. In this case, usually when you get a table data sent to you that's you know in Excel or something like that, they'll generally have a timestamp for that data, and then they'll have labels of what what signals these are, and then the numerical values will be in the row that corresponds to that timestamp. 
Okay, so those are the kind of values that you can get from the, the SCADA system. And that's the kind of format we're looking for in those data files. So how does SCADA Connect import work? Well, you have the SCADA system and you figure out which signals you want because most of the signals in the SCADA system you don't want. You don't want to, you don't care about the temperature in the pump station or whether the intrusion alarm has been sensed or anything. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there that you don't need. So you figure out which of those signals you really want. You select those and you can directly now, if you set up the connection, look inside the SCADA system and see what that data is or what inside that SCADA file and look at those values. But there's more to it than that. By building the SCADA elements and then connecting the SCADA element to the model element. So you place that little funny looking symbol down in your model and you connect that to a model element. And then that you associate that SCADA signal with one of these signals that you brought in, that SCADA elements associated with the signal. And then by magic, you put them together. So now you can compare model results to SCADA signals, which is a, a very powerful thing. Okay, so that's basically the way it works. This is the kind of stuff that you may look at. Now, in this case, we've exported it to, to Excel, but you can do this right inside the model nowadays. And this is, let me see, this is a model one. This isn't an Excel one. Okay. Uh, so the SCADA data might look like the red points. You get every 15 minutes, you get a tank, uh, pump flow right at the top part here. And in the bottom, you have a tank level every 15 minutes. And you go through and you can make comparisons. So the model run would be that blue line and the SCADA data might be the red. And this is this is really good, what you see here. I mean, your data usually doesn't look this nice as far as the model and the SCADA system, you know, agreeing that closely with one another. Usually there's a lot more noise. And you can also see problems too. If you look down at the bottom screen there, we see some periods of time where the SCADA signal was just lost and you got zero or no value or NAN, not a number or something like that will show up as your data value. Well, don't try to make the model agree with that value because that's a bad value from the SCADA system. Another thing we have circled there is another problem you sometimes run into with SCADA data are data that are what some people call latched data, that somewhere the communication broke down. And so the SCADA system just keeps seeing the same signal over and over again when the tank level is really changing, but it can't get you a newer value to update the SCADA signal. So it just keeps sending the last value that it had. So you got to be aware and know something about your SCADA data. So don't be afraid to ask the people in operations, well, can you explain why this happened? What does this value mean? And they'll say, oh, yeah, don't worry about that. That's just latch data. And, you know, when the signal comes back, it'll, it'll be good again. You know? And this is just some of the, the real world considerations that you have to deal with. Now, that's about the, the workflow of getting data from the SCADA signal system into the model. But now I want to focus more on using the model in the control room, getting the operators in that environment to think about modeling. And there's a lot of things they can do with it. They can just take the current condition and simulate it going forward to see what's going to happen if I operate my system normally. They can, uh, you know, go back and say, you know, we had something weird happen yesterday. Let's see what the model said happened at that time. And let's see what our SCADA data had. Maybe we could diagnose whether there was somebody, you know, filling up a water truck from our hydrant and we didn't know about it. And that's why the pressure dropped there. Or there was a, a fire that didn't get reported to us. And that's why the, the, the pressure dropped in that part of the system or the tank level fell really dramatically. There's something going on, you know, and you can go back and do those kind of studies to see what happened. There's also a tremendous amount of potential for energy management. I think we've talked about that in this course a good bit, that you can save energy. Use help, well, your model can help you save energy. Models are useful for emergency planning. You know, to run some exercises, you know, you're supposed to be doing this anyway as part of your security work is emergency planning. But let's use the model to actually simulate an emergency, simulate a contaminant in the system, or simulate uh, a major pipe break. And then also emergency response. Okay, in this case, you know, you have an emergency going on. Something has happened really bad, or even a little bad, and you want to be able to simulate what's going on in the system and then go forward. We've had cases where people, there's been some contamination event, and the people want to see where did that contaminant likely go? And if we open up these hydrants, how can we flush it to clean up this system? And people have actually done this with water gems. Also, operator training, there's a lot of potential to simulate things for op in operator training because what an operator, the way they usually train them is they sit them next to an experienced operator for about a week and they spend most of their time pretty bored talking about things and football and stuff like that. And every once in a while something happens of interest and they can show it to the uh, new trainee. 
it, it, you know, the thing is, though, if you're going to learn, say, to fly a, a 747, they just basically toss you the keys and let you drive it around the parking lot a few times. No, they, they make you sit in a simulator and learn how to fly the plane with the flight simulator. Well, your model is basically a flight simulator for the operators, and we can use them for that purpose. Also, uh, we'll show you some more place where you can actually run the model in real time, where you're just continuously running the model in real time. And this helps you in keeping the model up to date and calibrated. And it also helps a little bit what we call anomaly detection. When something happens that isn't supposed to happen, where the model and the real system diverge, you get to think about, well, what's going on in our system? So the tool we have for that is part of SCADA Connect, and we call it SCADA Connect Simulator. And what it is is taking water gems and breaking out just a small part of the functionality and giving the operator or somebody who's not an experienced modeler a really easy to use tool to simulate various kinds of emergencies or changes in demands or changes in how they want to control things in the system. And there are several ways you can run this so SCADA Connect Simulator. You can basically take a scenario. You got to have a starting scenario. It's called a baseline scenario here. Okay, EPS normal is what is in the screen for this example. And you can just run this as a the normal system. This is with typical operating conditions and typical uh, demands and such. And you can run it to see what's going to happen in the future. Or you can go and import initial conditions with those SCADA Connect signals. Bring in the, the, the tank levels or pump status right at the time you're interested in, whether it's right now or whether it was February 2nd or whatever it happens to be, you can bring those in and use that as a starting point of your model run. You go back and look at some historical data or current data, or you can run it live, or you're bringing right now, what's going on in my system? What's my latest SCADA values? And I want to start my model run from this. And what we have is a really neat feature now is that you can run this live automatically. So you can run this model every hour. Just, just have it in the background on a, on a monitor in your control room and just run the model every hour and say, this is our projection for the system for the next 12 hours or the next 24 hours. And just, just let it run automatically and look for warnings and errors and alarms and such. Now, when you're in the SCADA Connect simulator, you get to override some par parameters, but you don't have to get into the, the details of control statements and things of that sort or fire flow analysis. So you want to add a fire? But what you do is you basically just click on this button. It looks like a fire. Add a fire. Say what's the flow with the fire? When's it start? And how long is it going on? And, and often when they fight a fire, they'll, they'll fight a fire with a, a really high flow to, to control it. And then they'll use a lower flow rate to uh, after they control the fire to extinguish it. And you could put in several rows in this particular file to, to do that. Or you could just say, I'm going to adjust the demands. You know, today is going to be a day where I expect the demand to be 20% times what it usually is. It's been hot and dry, so we're going to get about 20% more water. So you just put in a multiplier of 1.2, and it'll just apply it globally. Or you could apply a flow to an individual demand node and just do a quick run. Okay. Now, sometimes you want to talk about, well, what if we change the way we're going to operate the system? So you get in there, and you could turn things off at a certain time uh, and then turn them back on at a certain time. Uh, to override the, the control statements that are in the model. Because sometimes you have controls in the model built in with those control statements that you've worked with. But sometimes you're going to say, today's going to be different. We're going to turn the pump on or off at a different time. And we're going to turn it off for a, a, a longer period of time. And also you get to the priorities. If you have two control statements that, that fight with one another, the one with the higher priority wins. So if you have, you know, I'm going to turn the pump on if the tank level gets like this. But I have a higher level priority command to turn on at this time, and the one with the higher priority will override in case there's conflicting commands. So that's just some of the, the value you have in, in this real-time operations of the mode. And people are starting to use this now. This is something I said was kind of a, an idea a long time ago, but now it's getting to be um, you know, something that people do. Another place where Modeling really helps in operations and energy management. I believe we talked about this earlier during the class. But we have a lot of really cool displays to show you how your systems operate. This is if you right click on a pump and pick pump definitions after an EPS run. We can show you where the operating point is, both on the head curve and on the energy characteristic curve. Now, here we you see you're operating right at the peak of the energy efficiency curve. That's great. You're operating right at the best efficiency point. But a lot of times you find out that you're operating somewhere pretty far from that best efficiency point as you move the time slider along. And it'll show you when you're operating poorly and you can do things to improve operations. The other graph here shows you something about peakiness of demands. Uh, what this is, is 
the cost of energy depends both on the the peak energy you use, and that's what these different lines are for different peak energies. And this is the average you use during that time period. So what this shows you, this is based on a real energy tariff from a real water utility. And if they have a, a peak demand of 100 kilowatts, and they run their average demand always at 100 kilowatts, that's a very even load, it only costs them about seven cents per kilowatt hour. On the other hand, if their average load is 100, but they have a peak energy load of 500, they're going to be paying 12 cents a kilowatt hour, almost twice as much. And this is the kind of analysis that you can do with water gems. And you know, running water gems energy calculations really has a very quick payback. You can get, uh, you can pay for any work you do an analyzing energy because you can always find some place we can save energy in the water system. Emergency planning. The red line here is the tank level on a normal day, and the blue one shows what it's going to look like when that fire that's going on. You got to call that as the fire at say hour six. And you can watch how the model predicts the tank level is going to drop and how it's going to come back. And you can see if you turn more pumps on, the pumps stay on longer as you try to refill the tank after the fire. And eventually you get back into the pattern that you, you've been used to having. You see that during the fire, that tank level dropped really low. Another use case for bringing modeling into the control environment is contaminant tracking. If you suspect there's some kind of contamination in the system, you can actually model it and show how that contaminated plume moves through the system. And with that, you can project where the plume is going to be at a certain time, and you can send the people out there to do flushing and all. Uh, and we've done some studies on this where if you can you know, do a good job estimating where the worst of the contamination is, you can get into the middle of it and flush the system. Or if you do it badly, you can actually spread the contamination out through a wider area and impact many more people. So it's, it's really useful to have a tool where if you, especially if you know what the source was, if somebody reports that they had some kind of a backflow prevent at an industrial site that it got in, that there's something got into the water. There's a story not too long ago I heard of a, a fire truck that was using some kind of foam fire suppressor and some of that foam got sucked into the water system because they did some things badly. And they, they, so they knew what the source was, and they were able to follow where that stuff went and, and flush that area very effectively. Now, when you're working with models, this is the way you look at water systems, right? I mean, you, you guys are experts now. You've had all this training, and this is a typical model view of the world. This isn't the view that the operators have in the control room. Their view of this same model, and this is, a, this is what their HMI might look like, their human machine interface where they have the tanks shown this way and they have pressure zones and they have individual pumps with their flow rates and whether they're on or off. And this is kind of a, a SCADA view. And we can do that. We can take modeling results now and populate a SCADA screen with results that didn't come from the sensors, but actually came from model calculations. And we can just plug those in to the, uh, to the, to the SCADA HMI, and the, the operator can say, okay, this is what your SCADA screen is going to look like at four o'clock today. It's going to look like this according to the model. And this is something that's really unique to what we have. And that one there was one that I actually drew that SCADA screen. So, I mean, that's how easy it is to put this stuff together if even somebody like me can do it. And this is an actual model from one of our users that, uh, you know, shows the SCADA screen, the real SCADA screen, but with values that came out from the hydraulic model. Uh, that's really something unique and powerful that we have. Okay, so what's the problem? Why isn't everybody doing this? Well, one of the big issues is security because you have the modeler and his, your computers over here and you have, you know, the, the, that, that talks to the SCADA system. You might be able to get data out of the SCADA system, but the SCADA system is over usually on the other side of either a firewall or just an air gap or just some, some really high security because they don't want stuff coming in out of the internet and getting into the SCADA system. I mean, that's one of the big things about security in SCADA systems. You don't want to connect the SCADA system to the internet. You just don't want to do it. So you've got to work on ways to keep the, uh, the SCADA system protected. So it's usually you have to make a decision whether you want to run this uh, control room simulator on the, the control room side of the firewall, or whether you want to provide a way to export data across the firewall and run it on the modeler side. And that's a, that's a local decision that has to be made. And uh, it's just an issue that you have to deal with because SCADA people are very afraid that somehow their data is going to get corrupted or their system is going to get corrupted 
by somebody in the internet. And there's a nasty world out there in the internet. So they're, they're, they're right in being concerned about this. Okay, so what, what do you see as the overall workflow, for example? Well, where you start is you've got to have a water gems model, preferably the EPS model. Then you can use the initial conditions for that are in this scenario you're running, or you can import new initial conditions. Then you can overwrite things like override the demands, put a fire on, close a valve, control the pumps differently. You can specify that to override what came in from the existing scenario, and you run it. And you can look at the results through water gems results, just as you always could. But you can also take that data, push it out to the OPC server, and display it right in the SCADA screen. So an operator who, who understands the SCADA HMI screens will understand the modeling results. So this is the general workflow to use this. And there's a couple of steps that are involved in setting this up. You've got to you know, build those SCADA signal elements. You're going to bring in initial conditions and build those. And this is a one-time thing you do. Also, if you want to push the results out to the OPC server, you've got to tell it where that OPC server is, essentially. And if you want to display the results that you calculated in the HMI, you've got to provide that mapping that this tag in the OPC server corresponds to this field in the model. So those are kind of reasonable things. The blue things you do kind of once, though. You set that up, and you know it's good. OK, so that brings us to a summary here. So you've built your, your model. You have this great thing out there that you're using for your planning or design work. But there's a lot more you can do. You made this investment. You bought the software. You calibrate the model. You got the field data. Why not use it for other things? And there is a lot of, of potential for extending the use of your model into operations. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.